Hi, welcome. This is Online Worship with South North Baptist Church. It's great to have you with us. If you'd like to know more about us, we'd love to connect with you. So do reach out. We're now a couple of weeks into 2024, as I record this. How's your year going so far? Maybe you made resolutions. Have you kept them? Are you sticking to your plans? Or maybe it's not going so well. Whatever we're doing, however we are, the Bible reminds us that each day is from God, a new opportunity. His mercies are new every morning. The Bible says in him we live and move and have our being. And so we're going to give thanks to God today and worship him, turn our attention to him. And we begin with some songs of worship. You are 
I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over our coming and going, both now and forevermore. Lord, thank you that you are our hope. You don't sleep or slumber. You're watching over us. Meet with us as we continue together now by your spirit. Amen. As I said at the start, thanks for joining us. It's great to see you today. If you have questions about our church, you'd like to know more, do get in touch. You can find full contact details at the end of the video. Or why not connect with us, reach out to us on social media to search for South Norwood Baptist Church. And don't forget, like, and subscribe that way you won't miss any content we put out content we put out maybe changing a bit over the next few weeks so keep your eye on this channel so you don't miss out as well as this online worship we have a physical building in south norwood if you're in our area we'd love to connect with you gather there from 10 on a sunday to worship together as a local church we exist solely by our church family. We're self-funding. We rely on the generosity of our members. And so we'd like to say a big thank you to those who contribute to our family pot that make our church life happen in so many ways, whether it's about finance or serving. As we enter a new season, if you're part of our church, we'd love to encourage you to think about serving. But also if you're able to give and contribute financially, Here's how you can do so. And if you'd like more information about this, do get in touch. We're going to take a few moments to pray now, and then we're going to hear our Bible reading. Today's Bible reading is from the Gospel of Mark. Father, we thank you know what is going on in our lives. Lord, you know our joys and our sorrows our hopes and our fears. In the quiet, we offer ourselves to you now, asking that you will come, meet with us, whatever we're walking through. Father, we thank you that you know all that's going on in the world, things we see in our media, things that we're not aware of. Lord, we cry out to you for peace. We cry out to you for justice. We cry out to you for a cease and end of war. Whether that's in Israel and Palestine, in Ukraine and in other nations. We pray that we will be moved with compassion. Pray that your kingdom will come. Father, you know what's going on in our families, in our neighbourhoods, in our networks. Lord, in the moment of quiet, we offer to you those we know who need your touch in a special way today. Father, draw close, comfort the bereaved, the needy, the sad, the lonely. Encourage those who need encouragement, heal the sick. Lord, do what only you can do, that you may get the glory. And we say, our Father who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Jesus announces the good news. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew cast a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in the synagogue, who was possessed by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Last week we introduced our theme for 2024, fixing our eyes on Jesus. It comes from the book of Hebrews, where they say we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Challenge not to be distracted, not to go back, but to run the race. You can catch up on teaching on that on this channel and the midweek thought, what are you looking at that explores that theme? But as I said then, if we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, we need to be sure that we're fixing our eyes on the real Jesus. And the best way to do that is through the accounts of his life, his character, his teaching, his death and resurrection that we read in the Gospels. Prayerfully, in the power of the Holy Spirit, that our eyes might be opened. And so today we're beginning this series, Meeting Jesus, thinking about stories of Jesus from the Gospels. Today's reading was from Mark's account of Jesus, and Mark doesn't give us Christmas, which is a shame because I quite like Christmas. But Mark jumps in, he says this is about Jesus, the Son of God, and then he starts talking about John the Baptist. The reason is John is pointing to Jesus. John is not the main character, but Jesus is the one who will baptise, he says, with the Holy Spirit. And so our reading begins by linking back to John the Baptist. It's after John was put in prison, Jesus began his earthly ministry. He started his public work. We're going to focus on two things Mark wants to teach us about Jesus and two responses we see from those he encounters in the verses that we heard. The first thing we see about Jesus might be easy to miss, but it's this, that Jesus is the fulfillment of what has gone before. That's what Mark wants us to see. That the story of Jesus is not told in isolation. Mark makes clear, as we already said at the very start of his gospel, that he's writing about Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And then he links back to the prophet Isaiah. This is something we see in the Christmas narratives in the other gospels. We saw it in our Christmas services. Matthew said a few weeks ago, we explored this, that everything that took place around the birth of Jesus was to fulfill what the prophets had spoken. And all of this finds a weight in the words of Jesus himself, his announcement. The time has come. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. 
Now, if you were to say that to people today outside of church context, that might sound strange. The time has come, the kingdom of God. These are not words we naturally understand in our context. But his first hearers would have grasped that, that this resonated with the Old Testament expectation that God would come to save his people, the Messiah would come. The hope at the time was that someone would come and kick out the Romans. People under Roman rule, an announcement of good news, the kind of announcement that usually came from the emperor. Jesus is announcing something big. The time has come for God's reign to be seen, to be revealed. It's, it's near, it says in some translations. It doesn't mean it's nearly here, it means it's close. It's at hand. This is good news. This is the time. Not just the time because John's in prison and now Jesus can get the limelight. No, this is the time because this is what the world has been waiting for. This is a new era. This is something much bigger than that. One might have described it in this way. This is a time heavy with eternal significance. Something new is here in a turbulent time and a turbulent place, a place of conflict and busyness and racial tension. We can often think that this takes place in Galilee and it's all serene, but this was a turbulent time in the Middle East. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? A place of foreign occupation. Here's an announcement. Good news gospel. Everything the people have been waiting for, everything the world needed has come. It finds its fulfillment in Jesus. The king has come. His reign has started. The appropriate time, the right time, has come. A new era. One commentator suggests these verses could be read like this. The time has been fulfilled with the result that God's reign has drawn near. Jesus is the one. The fulfillment. God, come down. The king has come. The one the world is waiting for. That's the first thing Mark wants us to see. Jesus is announcing the kingdom has come. Fulfillment. Secondly, though, throughout these verses is this linked idea of authority. Here is someone with authority, but not the authority that they were used to seeing from the Romans or the religious leaders. A different kind of authority. We first see this when Jesus calls his disciples. Usually if you wanted to follow a rabbi, a teacher, grow in your understanding, you found a rabbi you liked, you kept your job, and you studied under that rabbi. You went and learnt from them. But here Jesus does it differently. He walks along, he sees these fishermen, these pairs of brothers, and he says to them, come, follow me. And they do. It's the other way round at once, which is one of Mark's favourite phrases in his gospel. They leave everything and follow Jesus. They leave family and tradition and businesses that have been theirs for generations. You didn't change career, you kept in the family path. They left the workers in the boat. They left their family behind. There must have been something about Jesus for this to happen. One commentator says, without difficulty, Jesus attracts disciples to an itinerant life devoid of earnings. When you put it like that, it doesn't sound very appealing, does it? Can you imagine? You're doing your day-to-day -day stuff and this guy comes along and he says, come and follow me. You're going to fish for people. You're going to turn your life around. I wonder how you would have responded. Forward to our next story that we read and Jesus is in the temple. No, he's not. He's in the synagogue in Capernaum teaching. And what do we see? It says the people are amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Usually their teachers of the law would have said, well, Moses said, or Rabbi such and such said. Maybe, but like I do, this commentator says, this person says. But there was something different about Jesus teaching. Tom Wright suggests Jesus spoke with a quiet, compelling authority all of his own. And then Mark records this interruption. A man with an impure, an unclean, an evil spirit shouts out, often described as demon-possessed. And he seems to know who Jesus is. He calls out Jesus by name. He knows about him. 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But once again, Mark wants us to see Jesus' authority. People have already said, what is this teaching? It's not like our regular teachers. But now Jesus rebukes the man, rebukes the spirit, and the spirit leaves. The man is set free. And the people say, well, what is this? This is a new teaching. And with authority, he even orders evil spirits, and they obey him. The people link the teaching with the healing, with the exorcism, with the deliverance. It's not separate in the eyes of the hearers. Here is teaching, teaching about God, teaching of his kingdom with authority. There's something about Jesus. There must have been for them to leave everything and follow him. There must have been because they say he teaches differently to our usual teachers. There must have been because even the powers of evil obey and know who he is. He has authority as the son of God, as the word made flesh. Both people and evil forces are confronted because God's kingdom is here. The king has come. This is what it looks like when God is in charge. God's reign is power is here. Jesus not only spoke about the kingdom of God, he lived it, he demonstrated it. The next story in Mark's gospel is another healing you can read as you go on. The sick are healed, the lost are found. The oppressed are set free. There is welcome and inclusion. Jesus is in town. God is at work. He was teaching, but not just words, power. Mark wants us to see the authority of Jesus. He is the fulfillment. He is the bringer of the kingdom of God. And he has the authority as the king. One writer says every detail in the text piles on Jesus' authority. The kingdom of God has arrived. The Messiah has come. One writer says a king has arrived who rightly demands that we follow and radically obey him. But what is the response of the people? Well, firstly, they were a response of the fisher people, the fishermen. These brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John. Well, they leave everything, don't they, and follow Jesus. Jesus invites them. This is not normal to leave everything behind, as we said. You don't just pack up your stuff and leave your family. But without delay, they follow Jesus. This seems to be the embodiment of responding to Jesus' announcement. Turn around. Repent. The kingdom of God is here. Believe. They believe not just by saying, oh, we think that might be true. It's an action. It's faith. That's the first response. They follow. It's active. But a second response we see in the crowds, and that is amazement. Mark also highlights that response. He says twice in the passage we heard, using two different words. Verse 22, they are amazed or awestruck, knocked out by the teaching. It's so different. It's amazing. Verse 27, after Jesus rebukes the evil spirit, they are amazed. One translation says amazement gripped the audience. Then news about Jesus spread quickly over the whole area. Even in a world without social media, the news spread. Something different is here. There's this sense of wonder and awe. But it doesn't necessarily lead to faith, to life change, to following Jesus. One writer says, Jesus constantly filled people with a mixture of wonder, awe, and fear at what he did and said. And you see that as you read the gospel accounts. Jesus did things that were not expected, things that were powerful, things that people were like, what is this? Who gave them the right to do that? But it doesn't often or always lead to faith. Sometimes we see Jesus' authority brings up negative reactions and not just from the demons and evil spirits. So fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is Jesus to you today? In the opening of Mark's gospel, he wants us to see who Jesus is. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, the fulfillment of the Old Testament hope. The time has come. The kingdom of God is here. This is what it looks like when God is in charge. 
He was the one who can set people free. Heal the sick, forgive sins. We'll come to that. Offer new starts. And Jesus is the same today. He's not physically with us, but by his spirit. All those things are still happening. And we are his body, the church. But how will we respond? Maybe in anger. Some respond in anger. Some are bored. Seen it all before. Not interested. Some are amazed. But does it lead to faith? Does it lead to putting our trust, staking our lives on Jesus? The saviour of the will we repent, change our mind, turn around, leave our old ways. Knowing here is when we can believe it. And belief means commitment. One cannot truly believe without commitment, says Donald English. Maybe today is the day you need to go all in and follow Jesus. If we are followers, may we know him more. May we see him afresh. He is the fulfillment. He is the authority. He is the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, open the eyes of our heart. We want to see you. May we know you are the fulfillment, the hope of the world. You are God, the word made flesh. You have the authority. We yield to you today. May we not just be amazed, but may we follow you. Stake our lives on who you are. Amen.
If you'd like to know more about Jesus, who he is, what it means to follow him, we'd love to help you with that. Do reach out to us. I'm going to pray a blessing. Lord, may we have our eyes open to see you, King Jesus. Hearts set on following you. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, bless us, we pray. Amen. Back on this channel for our midweek thought on Wednesday. As I said earlier, make sure you like, subscribe, keep in touch. If you've got questions, do reach out to us. God bless. Have a great week. Take care.